or good morning. And wherever you are this morning, welcome to our worship from the parishes of North Dartmoor. After the wet and windy days of January and February, it does at last feel as though spring is beginning to break through, as the days lengthen and there are signs of new growth all around us. Psalm 100 encourages us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, and the birds in the hedgerows really seem to have taken that to heart. Well, today is the third Sunday of Lent, so we're now almost at the halfway point of our spiritual journey towards Easter. Each Sunday along the way, our Gospel readings give us a snapshot of a key event in Jesus' ministry, building up to that ultimate showdown in Jerusalem. Two weeks ago, we heard about Jesus' baptism and the time he spent in the wilderness. Then last Sunday, how he told his disciples for the first time how he was going to die and then rise again. And in today's Gospel reading, we hear John's account of how Jesus cleared the corrupt traders and money changers from the temple courts. A rare glimpse of Jesus expressing his anger at what he saw going on around him. And a reminder to us that when we encounter corruption and exploitation, sometimes words alone are not enough. We too have to act. But let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you. Lord, you are in this place. Fill us with your power, cover us with your peace, and assure us of your presence. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning expresses that desire for God's presence as together we seek his face. Come down, O love divine.
a few moments of quiet, we turn back to God. In the stillness, we recall those times when we've fallen short of the image of God that is within us and seek his forgiveness. The times when we've spoken in haste or have kept silent when we should have spoken out. When we've considered only our own needs and ignored the needs of others. When we've convinced ourselves that we can do everything in our own strength instead of relying on God. God, our Creator, your kindness has brought us the gift of a new morning. Help us to leave yesterday and not to covet tomorrow, but to accept the uniqueness of today. By your love, celebrated in your word, seen in your Son, breathed by your Spirit, take from us what we need carry no longer so that we may be free to choose to serve you and to be served by each other. Holy God, make it of all. Have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, servant of the poor, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. May God forgive us, Christ renew us, and the Spirit enable us to grow in love. Amen. The New Testament reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, starting at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Amen. The Gospel today comes from John 2. Jesus clears the temple courts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? 
that the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Praise be to God. We have two Bible readings that point to a failure of understanding. I can remember the first service I went to as an adult, coming into a church really for the first time by my own choice. I sat there on the hard wooden pew among strangers, thinking how could that chief priest and the scribes conspire to take this man Jesus for trial, he who had done no wrong and spent his time healing the sick, preaching the supremacy of love and teaching his followers. Yet they gave him over to the Roman authorities to die a dreadful death on the cross, accused of the criminal. That thought brought me to tears at the injustice. And thank goodness, no one asked, are you all right? Because that would have said goodbye to any remnants of my self-control. I wonder how we would have felt if we had been one of the crowd following Jesus on his road to Jerusalem and subsequent death. Even his disciples failed to understand his actions and teachings at times. After all, they were close, the close followers were fishermen who had left their families and nets to follow him and had their own preconceived ideas about the destiny of this man Jesus, who could heal the sick and command the seas. Who was he? Does he have a plan? Is he going to set the people free and bring in a new royal house? His first miracle at the wedding in Cana, earlier in the chapter from John, turning water into wine, points to his humanity. I feel almost one with him in wanting to avoid disappointing his family and friends and to enable people to celebrate. Of course, this miracle we can now see through the lens of time and theology as showing the kingdom of heaven breaking through to a stressed and needy people, and the first sign of his power. Though what his family and friends thought, we can only speculate. Moving on to our Gospel story today, John records the cleansing of the temple early on in Christ's ministry as the second sign of his divinity and power. The Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark and Luke, put this cleansing of the temple towards the end of Jesus' ministry. And this, the affront to the hierarchy of the temple authorities as a major reason for the antagonism of the high priest Caiaphas and the subsequent arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. Perhaps like me, you've often wondered why Jesus seems to deliberately provoked the scribes and the powerful elite. The disciples must have been perplexed. Though for us it's perhaps easy to understand his anger at the rank commercialism of the Gentile court at the temple. And again, it seems to point to his authentic humanity. And any Christian today has many reasons to feel that same anger at the injustice, corruption and persecution in the world. At first, the authorities don't seem prepared to intervene. That's surprising. After all, if you know anything about herding animals, you realise that it must have taken quite some time for Jesus to make the whip and to drive dozens, probably hundreds of animals from the temple. Remember, this was the time of Passover. And Jerusalem, together with the temple, was hugely crowded. He then upturns the tables of the money changers and scatters the precious coins on the floor. There must have been tremendous, prolonged uproar and confusion. Where were the temple police? 
Instead, they say, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. On the face of it, an outlandish statement, when it had taken years to build and was still not complete. Only much later did the disciples understand that Jesus was referring to the temple of his body, put to death, destroyed, and three days later risen again. I love the reading from Corinthians you've heard today. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Have you, like me, sat down and tried to make 20th century sense of the miraculous events we read of in the New Testament? Was the wedding party at Cana so drunk they couldn't tell water from wine? The feeding of the 5,000, did one person share his bread and fish, which led all the others to do the same? The lame man who walked, was it perhaps a psychosomatic illness? The calming of the Sea of Galilee in the storm, perhaps the influence of a charismatic leader restoring their confidence. Perhaps. But then in the words of an old, but favourite book of mine by Frank Morrison, Who Moved the Stone? The author's earnest quest to disprove the miracle of the resurrection ended in his conviction of the truth of it and the birth of a deep faith. Because if you truly believe that Jesus rose from the dead, from the tomb in the rock, then it's not necessary to make 20th century sense of the rest and it's relatively easy to believe and accept. And if you have been one of those close disciples of his, seeing the healings at first hand, experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit and meeting the living Jesus, you would have no doubt, would not have to deploy your wisdom to make sense of what seems impossible. Though I am still staggered by those early Christians, persecuted and killed for their belief in the gladiatorial arenas of Rome, who shared that real and life overwhelming faith. So where would our wisdom and anger take us today? Do we try to package God's intervention through his son in our world in a neat, tidy box? Do we have it all worked out in theological terms and a non-threatening, easy to live with faith? Because I'm not sure we can. We may never be able to logically work out with our wisdom or intelligence God's purpose or salvation but he has given us his spirit to guide us. I often think of Job in the Old Testament, suffering from all his afflictions, railing against God at the injustice of it all, when finally God answered him and said, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? From our Corinthian reading, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Hopefully, none of us are destined to fight lions in the arena in Rome or to be imprisoned for our faith, but God has called each of us in our own way through his Holy Spirit to work for his kingdom here on earth. And as we pass through this period of Lent, towards the promise of Easter. Let us remember that God has a purpose, that his ways, yes, may be beyond our understanding, but Jesus shows us the power, the grace, and the love 
of our Creator. So let us use our anger to care for his creation, his love to care for our community, and our faith to welcome his spirit into our lives. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Lord, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Forgive us, Lord, when we want proofs of our faith and ask for absolute certainty before we commit ourselves to you. Strengthen our trust in you, we pray, so that we who have not seen you may still believe and in believing may be blessed with the fullness of joy. Amen. Lord God, light up the things we need to see. Brush to one side the things we need to put out of our minds. Show us the doors we need to open and the paths we need to take. Be beside us as we go, so that the work we do is your work and the roads are your ways leading to your presence. Amen. Father God, guide us, we pray, that we may be more sensitive to the needs of our community. We pray for awareness of those needs, the need of the old to know they are wanted, the need of the young to know they are listened to, the need of all people to know that they are of value. Lord, Keep us aware. Amen. Thank you, Lord God, for being our Heavenly Father. Help us to grasp more fully the depth of your love and the security we have in you. Jesus said, This then is how you should pray. And we pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still. restores my soul and I will trust in you and I will trust in you for your endless mercy follows me your goodness will 
As we come to the end of our time together, we hope that you've enjoyed worshipping with us this morning and that you'll be able to join us again next week. Before we close, a final prayer of blessing. Be with us, Lord, wherever we are on our journey with you, in our fullness or in our emptiness, in our strength or in our vulnerability. Be with us whether or not we acknowledge our need of you and give to us a deeper caring for one another. And may our eyes see the signs of the wonders of God, our ears hear the sound of the Spirit calling us on, and our feet be placed in the footprints of Christ. Amen.